Is that working? Are you muted still? Yeah, I was, but now I'm not. Now you're not. Hey, Pamela. Hi. How's it going? Oh, it's going okay. We're starting to hit the point of the year where I'm like, dang it, I can't turn on the heat because it makes noise. And the terrible smell when you turn on your heat for the first time of the year. See, we have steam heat, so that's not a problem. Really? We have dead spiders cooking. Ew. Our, yeah. Um, yeah, we get that when we turn on the air conditioning. <laughs> but the weather's great, so it's been, <laughs> yes. it's been really nice here. It's crazy, actually. It should be rainy and really cold, but actually it's been beautiful. Foggy and then beautiful. So, And oh the God, cold, yeah. though, is here. I don't know if you can yeah. hear it in my voice. It's in my nose. It's in, I'll be coughing a bit. I'll try to We're, mute. Well, I'll mute the recording. Gonna... Yeah. <laughs> we'll both sniffle our way through yeah. this particular episode. Or I'll mute the hangout, and then Preston can hack it out of the, uh, out of the recording. So we'll go that way. Yeah, hopefully it won't get any worse. Um... <clears throat> And so just a reminder, I'm going to be gone. I'll be traveling. I'll be down in L.A. Uh, next week, starting um, Sunday to Saturday. So it's going to be kind of weird to try and record. But I think I think we'll be able to still pull it off next Monday. So Yeah, we'll have a special extra awesome studio for you. <laughs> well, not on the Monday, but for oh, okay. the other days. But I'll be, I'll, you know, we'll try and sort of hang out somewhere at the YouTube facility. And, and if they've got if, Wi-Fi, I hope they have internet there. If, if I can find a way to record while in Poland. I can find a way to record in L.A. That's probably exactly. true. Yeah. Um, okay, so if uh, people have never seen this before, what we are doing is a live episode of Astronomy Cast, our weekly uh, facts-based uh, journey through the cosmos. So we are going to be recording the show. It's going to take about half an hour, and, uh, and then we'll stick around and answer any questions that you might have about space and astronomy. Um, we make all kinds of mistakes. Um, Not that we, many. We make a, a million mistakes, uh, and so no, we, we just mispronounce stuff. <clears throat> yeah, we apologize to Preston. You can tell we made a mistake because we say sorry, Preston, and that's how Preston knows that he needs to go back and, and clean that up. He's our editor, by the way. Um, we've actually got a got a great team. I mean, it looks like it's just you and and me, but actually we've got a great team, right? Preston is our editor. Uh, Nancy Atkinson, who uh, works with me on Universe Today, does all of our show notes, and uh, Nathan got... Boltel does our transcripts, and Richard Drum makes sure that all of our video ends up politely on our YouTube channel. And uh, Susie Murph has just joined uh, the Universe Today team, and she's been helping with a lot of the pre-production and post-production. So actually, there's quite a big team involved. Did we get all the names right there? I think so. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, a lot of people work with us, so it's not just us. Um, we do the easy part. We do the hard part. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, are you ready to record? I hope so. Okay. Um, I am also ready to press record. Okay, I am pressing record. And it's recording, and it's recording in mono, and it's using the correct mic, and life is good. Testing, testing. Yeah, I'm good too. Um, and your big spaceship-like mic is looming. <laughs> yeah. Okay. People always want to know. It's a blue snowball. Um, and mine's a blue Yeti. A blue Yeti. So it's both by blue. Okay. Let's. Uh, let's. I want to start the recording again. I okay. Don't mind. No, that's fine. Let me bring it back to the surface. We. Okay. I'm pressing record again. I'm also pressing record. It's recording. Okay. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 319, The Zodiac. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Great. How is your weather there? It is gloriously sunny with orange and red leaves, and it's cold. Is it? Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's strangely warm here. Normally it's a lot colder. We've, getting some night, we've got our first frost just a couple of days ago, but it's just been you know, so warm outside. Uh, it's been great. We, we've hit the time of the year where you occasionally find critters that like didn't find some place warm enough before the sun went down just... Frozen in space, place. Oh, yeah. Uh, but you got you got a frog pick, right? I did, I did. 
I got a glorious, it's a toad. It's an American a toad. toad that likes to scare the bejesus out of me once or twice a week. How, how big are they? Um, this one's about the size of, of a fist. It's, it's just big enough to be a challenge to pick up and move someplace that it won't get stepped on. That's, that's a big <laughs> amphibian. We don't have it's anything awesome like that. Awesome amphibian. I think I saw some in Hawaii, so those big cane toads. Same kind of. Oh, those monster. are huge. Yeah, they yeah. were really big. Uh, but don't lick them. Um, no. All right, well, let's get rolling. Uh, so, although the zodiac is best known for astrological nonsense, it has a purpose in astronomy too. The constellations of the zodiac define the plane of the ecliptic, the region where the sun, the moon, and the planets appear to travel through the sky. What are the constellations of the zodiac, and how do astronomers use them as waypoints? So, I get to make this joke every couple few episodes. So, Pamela, can you tell me my horoscope? No. Okay. I'm a Leo. Does that not help? No? no. Okay. And are um, you sure you're a Leo, actually? Oh, is there a bit of a controversy? I'm well, August 19th. Yeah, apparently okay. I'm a Leo. I don't know. So I'm looking this up. You're August 19th. Yeah, you're actually a Leo. Okay. I, why did you even ask me that question? <laughs> So, so one of the things that completely baffles me about how astrologers use the zodiac is, is they take the year and they divide it up into completely even chunks, 12 completely even chunks, and they assign each of these chunks to a constellation that at some point during that span of time is probably where the sun is located. But the thing is, the real constellations, they, they aren't all equal in size and the sun doesn't dwell in them for equal amounts of time so if you look up the dates that that astronomy says the sun is in the constellation Leo it's it's not that nice 30-day chunk that astrologers identify it's actually 37 days and it goes from August 10th to September 15th which is not what astrologers say Right, so they mean it is actually located within the boundaries of the constellation of Leo with all of its strange jaggy lines. Um, okay, so let's go back a bit in sort of back to the beginning here. So, wh okay. so what is the zodiac? The zodiac is a group of constellations that uh, form a whole variety of different animals and humans that the sun passes through as it... Uh, changes its alignment relative to the stars as the Earth goes round and round it. So the sun appears to move in the sky because of our motion. And each day, if you look right before sunrise, you can see what constellation the sun's going to be in when it comes up. And this has been used for a long time, right? They've, yeah. This is the way that they've kind of measured the the position, the months. I mean, do they, 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 so do you know when and sort of where the current concept of the zodiac came from? Well, the, the current constellations, it, it, they actually go back so far that there's people uh, who argue over the linguistics of some of them thinking that the names actually go back uh, prior to the separation of many of the languages in the Mediterranean. Uh, you can take many of our constellations back to Ptolemy and Hipparchus and, and we've been using them for a long time. We're, we're basically using the Greek constellations. Uh, the Romans couldn't be bothered to come up with their own so they stole them wholeheartedly and just renamed a few of them. Um, but it's, it's a set of constellations that in the Western world uh, astrology says there are 12, astronomy recognizes 13, and they're the ones the sun goes through. If you go to other cultures, you'll see other constellations, although uh, one of the things I love is, is the Aztecs. They see Scorpio as a scorpion as well, uh, so there are some similes because when you look up, some shapes just stand out, and Scorpio is one of them. And so what are the constellations that are in the zodiac? I have to read a table here. I'm an uh, astronomer who doesn't memorize things often. Uh, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpius, Ophiuchus. And so the Ophiuchus one, I think people won't be familiar with it being in the uh, in the zodiac. It's it's the serpent bearer and. Um, so, so what happens is Scorpius, which is the, the one that gets all the hype, 
uh, if you look at how much of Scorpius actually crosses into the path of the Sun, the Sun only spends seven days going across poor little Scorpius's bit that's in the ecliptic. Um, and then the rest of the time, for 18 days, the Sun is actually in the constellation Ophiuchus, the serpent bear. Um, I'm actually in Ophiuchus. If you care about where the Sun is on the day of your birth, I'm December 12th. Um, and Ophiuchus actually is the, the zodiacal sign for anyone who is born between November 30th and December 17th. Wow, I wonder what their personalities are like. Well, I, that's the ludicrous thing about all of this. Is, is in astrology they have charts and I thought for the longest time that they were actually using real charts like planospheres and stuff like that like we use in astronomy and they were just making up stuff but they're not even using charts that actually reflect the sky because they take the year and as I said they just divide it up into 12 equal sized bits and and if you travel and see any of the amazing paintings that are in various places in the world that depict the different signs of the zodiac they always have these equal bands that, that the Sun appears to pass through and that's not the case um, so when when they make charts they're using a chart that doesn't actually depict the actual locations of the constellations. So are they like on average accurate? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh -uh. Right. Not, not really. I mean, so, so here's the thing. There, there's some that are, are worse off than others. Um, you have constellations like Pisces, which is 38 days long. Taurus is 37. Leo is 37. Then you have, well, the little guy, Scorpius, that's only seven days long. And Virgo, Virgo is 45 days. And so it, it half the people whose actual sign, if, if you look to see where the sun actually was on the day of their birth, they're thinking that they're probably a Libra and they're actually a Virgo. So I... This, like I said, this is just one of those things that baffles me. I understand that symmetry is good. We all want things to be equal. And it's way easier to cast charts if all of the time periods are the same because you don't have to pay attention to precession and details like that. But dang it, it, it that's not the way the universe works. And if you're going to make stuff up, at least ground it in the reality of how big the constellations are. That you just ask for too much. I do. I do. Um, so how do astronomers use the zodiac? I mean, you know what? This is kind of funny. So we and I, I, with our app, you know, we did this phases of the moon app, and yeah. we included the zodiac sign that the moon is is currently in, in the so people can kind of know they can plan their observing. They go, oh, the moon is in Virgo. Right. I'm going to stay away from Virgo tonight and sort of try and try some other places. Um, but people give me give us a hard time. But there's a there, there are legitimate reasons yes. to want to know where objects are in this in the sky. It, it, the best way to think of it is it's like a county map of, of the sky. Uh, each constellation is a region of sky that uh, you can select for for naming stuff, finding stuff. And it's just an easy way to find your, your way around. So I, I know here where I live in the Midwest, when they say there's a tornado in Madison County, I know which cities are potentially going to be impacted. If someone says there's a full moon in Sagittarius, I know it's not a good time to go looking at the center of the galaxy because its light is going to get blotched out by the moonlight. Um, so we use it to figure out where things are and we also use it for naming schemes. Very roughly, um, the brightest stars and constellations are a Greek letter followed by a Latin form of, of the name of the constellation. So you have um, Alpha Orionis is the brightest star in the constellation Orion. You could also say uh, Alpha Oh, Aquarii, or it, it's it's all of the constellations have an alpha. They have a beta. They have a gamma. Uh, they're not necessarily alpha isn't always the very brightest. Sometimes it's the one that's the furthest to the left. It 
depends on where it was when Bear named things. Uh, we also use it for naming variable stars. The variable stars in a constellation start with AA, work the, their way through to ZZ, and then start with V for something something that I don't remember off the top of my head, but that's how we name things is like V489 Pisces. Um, it's, it's a good way to find ourselves with a good observing run is you just look for things with the right types of names. It's how we name galaxy clusters, the Virgo cluster, the Coma cluster. Oh, we use them for, uh, for comets as well. Because the comets are often moving through the plane of the ecliptic as well. I think so, you mean meteor showers. No, no, with the comets, like 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 such and such comet is currently in oh, Virgo yeah. and yes. it's moving into, so, you know, look in this area. Because the comets yes. are moving, so you need to know where, right. to, where to find them, right? Right, but, but uh, what I thought you were going for is, is it's also how we name meteor showers. So if you want to look at the Geminids, which, which are up during my birthday, um, they, they irradiate away from a constellation in general, and that's the, the point in the sky where the uh, Earth's atmosphere is touching the debris stream that was left behind by a comet or an asteroid in the past. So we, we use the name of the constellations for lots of different things. Right, you've got the, uh, the Perseids, the Oranids, the Geminids, and a lot of those match up with the... Uh, um, with the with the zodiac constellations as well. Um, so <clears throat> now I'm thinking about I'm running this sort of model of the solar system in my brain, and I know and, you know the plane of the ecliptic is the sort of the baseline, right? Yeah. But the moon can be above or below the ecliptic. The Five planets, degrees. The planets can be above or below the ecliptic. Yeah. So so does I mean is the zodiac like a zone? Well, each constellation has a, a physical size on the sky and what's kind of awesome is is they are big enough that for the most part all the solar system bodies that are bright enough to be seen by eye and a few that aren't necessarily seen by eye like most of the asteroids for instance are all nicely confined to within the zodiac some stray but not very much and so in general if you want to go out asteroid hunting comet hunting or you just want a good chance of randomly stumbling across one of the known planets um, looking in the zodiac is a great place to start so we've talked about how the earth's axis is is changing over time with this precession of the of the equinoxes what impact is that having on the uh, on the zodiac well th this is where you hear things like the age of aquarius um, so so as things slowly change over time um, the way they align with the dates changes with time as well. So when we have the solstices is very gradually changing. Um, and this lines up with making great songs, apparently. So so I don't understand. So like the you know, the age of Aquarius, I don't know what would be after the age of Aquarius. So so what's what's lining up here? Uh, so I my brain just completely spaced on which particular special day it is. Hold on. Sorry, planet, brain, death. Sorry, Preston. Say it with me, everyone. Sorry, Preston. Sorry, Preston. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I hate having to Google things while on air. I don't want the astrological meaning. I want to know which special day of the year is the reason that we use this. Um, I can look that up here. It, it, that doesn't work. Um, takes 2150 years for the sun position to the time of the vernal equinox to move to a new con. So it's, it's a is the vernal equinox. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So Thank pretend you. I just Sorry. asked that question. Yes. Uh, so, so what what ends up mattering is the position of special days of the year. In this case, it's the spring equinox. So, if you look at the the dates uh, we have for the age of Aquarius, well, it doesn't quite line up right now. But that's because these ages are getting defined by astrology. 
but uh, you look to see where is the vernal equinox. And right now Aquarius is February 16th to March 11th in reality, but the vernal equinox is in the constellation Aquarius if you follow uh, astrology, which uses dates that don't reflect the actual position of where the sun is in the sky. Right, and I mean, the I mean, we talked about the, uh, the procession of the equinoxes, and I, I'm trying to remember, it's like 90 seconds every year, I think. It's it's There's one human amount. lifetime. It moves one degree on average, and that's yeah. kind of awesome. Yeah, like eighty years or so, it moves one degree, and so, I mean, these these seasons are shifting. These, and people don't realize that that, you know, few thousand years from now, the seasons will be all <laughs> skewed up. They'll all be changed. Everything's not permanent. We're wobbling. No, <laughs> but it it. Uh, works out well enough with the current calendar we have that we don't stress about it too much, although we do have to keep track of our positions of the stars. So when you look up things in old books, they'll give you 1950 coordinates. When you look them up in new books, they'll give you 2000 coordinates. And pretty soon we're probably going to have to have the 2050 coordinates. The 2050 coordinates. Just to keep things moving. I mean, we always have to calculate them um, in terms of where are the, the stars tonight relative to the coordinate system. But for books, we, we give set coordinates. And one of the screwy things that we have to deal with is as the stars move, what do you do when they exit the constellation they used to live in and enter a new constellation, but their name is tied to the old constellation? So you run into this with variable stars that were on the edges of constellations and have high precession. Uh, as they march across the borders, do you rename them? And in some cases, you end up with objects with multiple identities. Now, I've got some mnemonics here. So I don't know if you, uh, <clears throat> if you have an easy way to remember your, uh, your zodiac, but uh, I've got I a few. I write them in a table. Do you? Okay, I've got a few here. Um, so uh, these are from these are from the internet. Uh, as the great cook likes very little salt, she compensates, adding pepper. So as the great Aries, Taurus. Aries is where you started. Okay. Yeah, Aries, Taurus, Gemini. So you're starting Cancer. with the vernal equinox. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> really boring teachers can live very sadly since apples give worthless feelings. Really? That is insane. Okay. <laughs> All the great constellations live very long since stars can't alter physics. That's pretty cool. The, the, the ramble twins, crab liverish, scaly scorpions are good water fish. <laughs> I love mnemonics. <clears throat> It was great. Uh, this is like has nothing to do with the zodiac, but as you recall, after uh, Pluto was unplaneted, people had to come up with a with a new mnemonic for uh, um, for the solar system, right? And so the, I like the uh, replacing nine pizzas with nothing. All mothers <laughs> became much crueler. Yeah, my very excellent mother just served us noodles. It's the one I always use. Um, it's much more helpful. So. I mean, we've, we've really tried to sort of steer clear of astrology. Yes. And, and uh, except to just make fun of it nonstop. And we're going to do that right now. But I want to sort of get a sense of, like, where does astrology, how does this, how did this happen? Why well, do people even think this kind of thing? And, like, why the zodiac and why the sun sign? So, like, debunk it. <laughs> so if, if you look at it, each culture has their, their own way of looking at these things. Chinese culture cares about the year of your birth. Uh, Greek culture used to look at the constellation of your sun sign. And each of these try to tie certain characteristics of personality. And you have to imagine that, that people started by imagining that they noticed 
people born in certain months all shared similar characteristics. There's often some sort of at least a made-up shrivel of information at the core of a lot of superstitions. And one of the things that I found really interesting was several years ago there is a neat body of research where they looked at how a child's personality depends on things like what was the weather during the mother's pregnancy, uh, what was the mother's emotional state during pregnancy. And there's some thought now that if you have a whole bunch of moms who suffer through the exact same miserable winter and give birth in March or April, that their children are all going to have the same disposition. Uh, if a bunch of mothers go through the same time of plenty and sunshine and joy and give birth in late October, their children are going to have a similar personality. So it's possible that there's this shred of truth based on biochemistry and what you're exposed to in the womb that is a the heart of defining each of our personalities but at the same time uh, yeah it, it, then they just took it and kept going and then it became a where were the planets where were the and in astrology like I said they they aren't using the actual positions of the Sun they're using charts that divide the year evenly um, not all astrologers understand what it means to say that mercury is in retrograde um, which doesn't even really make sense considering it's internal to us from the Sun and and so you have all of these strange things that have cropped up over the millennia that move it away from trying to understand a set of why do these groups of people have similar dispositions which can be explained with biochemistry to instead trying to find a uh, alignment in the stars that describes why some people go on to become kings. Yeah, I guess you can imagine if there was like a particularly harsh winter and the children were born during and the mother was suffering during that winter, you could imagine a certain disposition for the children, yeah. not just sort of emotionally, but you know, physically, just they were sicklier, or they were hungrier, or they were stronger. Who knows, right? Right. And you could imagine a a whole cohort that shares a lot of attributes, and then you could say, well, they were all born in this time, so therefore, that's that could be, and then and then nonsense, right? <laughs> um, but then they just take it to the next the levels of extreme. So they'll they'll say like, what planet it's in matters. What what planet was in your sky? What you know? Where was Mercury? Where was Venus? Where was Mars? Where was the Moon? Yeah. My my favorite practical <laughs> joke of all time was David Lambert at McDonald Observatory, uh, who's now actually the director of the observatory, called up Bill Cochran, who's one of the planetary scientists at McDonald, and. Um, Bill had just found a planet uh, around a nearby star. It's actually a bin binary system. And David uh, Lambert was pretending, because he can do a very good Indian accent because he works there a lot, uh, to be a, an Indian father trying to get the position of the extrasolar planet so that he could get an accurate horoscope cast for his children's wedding. And and so you can just imagine as we are now upwards of thousands of suspected planets and near a thousand known planets. Um, yeah, at what point do you stop caring, and how do you take into consideration all the asteroids that that come much closer to the Earth than the planets and have more of a gravitational impact? Um, what do you consider needed and not needed? And yeah, it just starts to become ludicrous. Yeah. It's a chaotic system. <clears throat> right. So now, I mean, is there I mean, is there any possible way that you could get any kind of influence gravitationally from anything? Like that's the only thing I can think of, right? Gravity. <laughs> the moon does have a biological impact on the planet because of tides. Um, but beyond the moon, not so much. Right, right. So it's just it's just nonsense. Yes. Um, okay. I was out of things to talk about. Did you have anything else you wanted to bring up that you'd prepped? Well, it's, so I can pass on. The table of information that I'm looking at is actually now posted over on CosmoQuest's Educator Zone. So if you go to CosmoQuest.org and click Educate, uh, there's a new post up on 
uh, a science cafe that I got to do with some amazing people from Discover the Cosmos in Greece of all places this summer and there's nothing quite as interesting as debunking astrology in the country that's responsible for our current zodiac and we were up in the village of Mills which uh, has a 18th century church with an amazing whole set of paintings including one that depicts the zodiac so we had people stand up and first uh, 12 of them evenly space themselves in a circle locking hands uh, around our human son and then we had them rearrange themselves and throw an ophiuchus in the actual spacing just to show how very different the actual spacing is compared to the equal spacing of astrological charts. I wonder if anyone will actually use the 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 real astronomical spacing as opposed to the <laughs> the astrological I, one. I'm sure there probably are some people out there who do that but they're not the ones who are writing for the newspapers or your major astrology magazines. Right. They're already making stuff up. They might as well make everything up. Uh, cool. Well, thank you very much, Pamela. <laughs> My pleasure, Fraser. All right. Let's stop that. And we'll save it. <clears throat> and export it. 319. Yep. This is the exciting part where you watch us save. Saving. So I'm going to take advantage of a captive audience and show off some of my graphics because I like my graphics. Screen share away. There's my phone ringing. <laughs> it always does. So... Someone's going to tell me that my Windows computer is sending errors. They're receiving virus messages from my Windows computer. Okay. This happens to you regularly? Yeah, this doesn't happen to you? No. Oh. Yeah, there's some scam that goes on where they call you and tell you that they're that this is Windows technical support and they've been receiving error messages from your comp your Windows computer and that and then they we don't have any Windows money. computers in our house. Well, I, I don't either. <laughs> that's not the point. <laughs> the point is that that's that they don't they don't assume they don't know what you have. We also don't have a home phone, so that's probably the real reason we don't get those. Oh, there you go. Okay. Now I'm sure they're just calling numbers at random. But but anyways, um, so so here's a screen share of of the table of actual dates and how people can line up spaced out. Uh, the way the actual constellations are. And we created a bunch of artwork on the constellations. And this is all released under Creative Commons so that you can print it out and um, have the, the signs that get used to abbreviate the constellations. But then with each one, we also included a little bit of science. So this one, for instance, says home of NGC 772 with supernovae 2003 HL and 2003 IQ. Um, so we tried to do a modern take. And we had fun doing it. And it's all available online. That is really cool. When did you do that? Uh, this was while I was in Greece this summer. Yeah, OK. Yeah, it's cool. So, so I think this is sort of a first. You, you in sort of coordinating a show, put together a blog post that relates to it and included some educational materials. This I, I tried. This feels <laughs> really comprehensive. I'm I'm really impressed. Um, okay, so let's see if we've got any questions. And yeah, I'm going to tweet the link to that activity. Somebody is really trying to get a hold of me. Do you need to go check? Yeah, I should go check because I okay. can hear. Okay, I'll be back yeah. in one second. Okay. Um, so, hello, everyone. I do not have all of your comments in front of me, so I'm now going to blather um, haphazardly. Um, so, yeah, it's it, one of the things Fraser and I are doing is we are trying to um, 
make it so that we know ahead of time what we're going to be recording. So if you take a look at our calendar, uh, you can see our next few episodes are going to be about the sun. And one of the things I'm going to try and do is if we have educational materials related to the different concepts that we're discussing here on Astronomy Cast, we're going to work to put those live over on CosmoQuest. Uh, at CosmoQuest, we have facilities for you to participate in doing science. Please, please, please go help us map the moon. We need your help. Um, and then we also have materials for teachers so that they can do a more effective job at teaching real science in the classroom. I see Fraser's arm. Fraser's elbow is exiting the room. Uh, and um, we have forums. We have lots of ways for you to get involved. I am going to attempt to find where all of you might be leaving questions, because otherwise I feel like I'm blathering kind of stupidly. Well, I am blathering kind of stupidly. Uh, so let me see what I can do to fix that. This feels like some sort of weird interlude. He's coming back. Yay! Sorry. It's all right. I learned I, I am not good at blathering incoherently at our audience. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, <laughs> take a few tips from the master. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I had a, uh, I had a sick, have a sick child. He's coming. Oh. Home, so. Okay. Yeah, it's this cold. Ugh. Um, okay, so we've got a question, a few questions, I think. Uh, one, uh, Jens Riggleson said, Pamela, did you see that variable stars have great precession and thus move from one constellation to not, another? Not all of them. Some of them have precession and, let me rephrase that, all stars at a certain level are moving through the sky. Some of them are moving faster than others across the sky. They have more precession. Um, or more, precession is the wrong word, more... Um, I have a cold too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they they have more motion across the sky, um, and and as they move from one constellation to another, we end up with identity crises. This isn't a matter of variable stars in particular are moving faster than other stars, um, but like Bernard's star is one of the stars that's moving fastest across the sky. It didn't start out near the edge of a constellation, so renaming it hasn't been an issue. And its name is Bernard Star, not named after a constellation. Variable stars in particular are named after the constellation they're in. So when they decide to move from one constellation to another, proper motion, due to large proper motion. We're going to have ourselves a problem. Yeah. Right. Well, we'll let the astronomers thousands of years from now worry about that. Um, okay, so... Uh, Dex Luther says, what about the 13th Zodiac? Lol. Now, <clears throat> um... Ophiuchus. That is, that is Ophiuchus, which we meant. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Unless there's some other reference that I'm not aware of. <laughs> Red5 2013 <laughs> tweeted, good job filling. No, that was not a good job. That was a completely blathery job filling. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's it. Yeah, so Ophiuchus. And it's great that you say it, because I'm Ophiuchus. Ophi Ophiuchus. That one I know how to pronounce. Yeah. Um, uh, Graham Sticking says, the priest needed, needed to find the right time to conduct ceremonies. So that's right. Yeah. So didn't astronomy originate from astrology? According to Professor Alan Chapman's book, Gods in the Sky, early astronomy was conducted by priests. And yes. the priests needed to find the right time to conduct their ceremonies, which I think is... That, that's all true. It's just how did we end up with evenly spaced ones, which is what baffles me. Right. Well, they just, they just smoothed, they just averaged out, they smoothed over the rough edges. Um, <laughs> Hugo Burnham is is trying to uh, to come up with a mnemonic for astrology. Well, well, a mnemonic is a way to to take a like a bunch of things to to memorize them, right? So my very excellent mother just served us noodles for for all the planets. Uh, so he's trying his take a crack at uh, astrology. So far, I've got a silly try regarding our lives of gigantic. I don't know. It needs a Y. Yesterday's. Um, 
Uh, whoa. Okay, so Ronnie Pearson asks, <clears throat> is it impossible that gravity could affect inter-universes, and in that case, could the multiverse then become science? Whoa. So I, I, I guess the question is, could we have gravity? I mean, this is this brain theory, right? This, this yeah. M theory that you've got these brains and that gravity is weaker than the other forces and we're not really sure why. And one of the possibilities is that, in fact, the it's gravity leaking is, into other dimensions. is leaking into other dimensions across these universe membranes into other universes. And, uh, and the answer is... Oh. Yeah, we have no evidence. This is not a predictive theory at this point. It is a mathematical... It's good math, right? It's people I know who do not do brain theory for a living um, and have reviewed the math and are far more mathemat mathematically savvy than I am say that it's very ugly math. Oh, really? So it's not yeah. even good math. It's ugly math. Well, it's good math, but it's not eloquent math. Wow, that's, you know, you don't need to have eloquent math. You just need to have the math the math work. But I mean, you know... But you need the math to work and you need it to be predictive for it to be science. Right. And this it's is that like lack of predictiveness. Well, it's predictive. I mean, some of the string theory stuff is predictive. You just need instruments that are theoretically impossible to make that would allow you to, to determine if it's true or not. And in this case, I guess you'd need some way to get outside of the universe. Right. To see other brains and then calculate their interactions. First, calculate how much gravity is leaking out of the universe, and then, you know, and find out how much, and then go to that other universe and find out how much of our gravity is leaking into their universe, and then you can determine whether it's true or not. And we can't get there from here. Right, but you know, I mean, you're you're pretty hard on the poor string theorists. I I I am, but it's more a matter of. I hear so many people saying, well, you're not even allowed to consider things that aren't evidence-based. And then the exact same people turn around and are string theory, string theory, string theory. And, and there, there's a logical jump that breaks me every time. What's the logical jump? Um, someone who says that you can only discuss and consider as part of reality things that are evidence-based and uses that argument to decry everything from religion to different moral perspectives, but then turns around and makes proclamations like one I've heard very often is Stephen Hawking's A Br uh, Brief History of Time is My Bible. Um, you can't turn around and say that you want everything in your reality to be evidence-based and then say you want everything in your reality to also include string theory. Because it's not evidence based yet. Yet. But but I think, you know, I mean, this is the situation. I mean, you look at like the Higgs boson and you had the situation where they had a, a sort of there was a bunch of particles that were being discovered, certain predictions that were being made, and they said if at some point down the road you come up with a superconducting right. super collider, then then you might be able to find out if this particle exists or not. But but at every stage in that, it was known what was needed to accomplish it. And it was a technological challenge and it was a monetary challenge. Yeah. But just like the early uh, predictions made with relativity weren't things that could be done at that moment, it was known what needed to be done. And Last I reviewed string theory, it didn't have any completely unique and physically possible tests. There were some tests, but they weren't tests that separated it from supersymmetry at all. Right. Um, and when you have a theory that says, the only things I can predict, you have to break the laws of physics to test, that's not predictive. But isn't that just the beginning? I mean, isn't that just sort of where this this is bordering on? We should do a show on it. But <laughs> but isn't this isn't that just the beginning? I mean, what you do is you just sit down and just kind of say, here's all the problems with the current universe. We don't understand this stuff. Let's start doing math to try and figure out some possibilities. What if you know at this core place, gravity and the so you know, so the thing right? that makes me consistently suspicious with this is when I sit down and talk to people who don't have a financial foot in the game. They don't get grant money, they don't publish papers, their tenure doesn't depend on string theory. 
and I ask them, do you think this is real, the consistent answer is no. And that's part of peer review, is, is having people who have the, the knowledge to critically review a subject, review it, and say whether or not they think it's valid. And, and over and over, this is sort of my favorite, party trick is the wrong term, but my favorite thing to do when I meet people who are more mathematically savvy than I am and have reviewed string theory critically is to ask them, do you think this is a valid theory that's going to pan out? And over and over again, I, say, I, I hear people say no. And, and that's where I start to question, well, why don't we spend more time investing in supersymmetry and, and start realizing that other theories just don't have the PR that string theory has. Or like loop quantum gravity. Right. So, I mean, are there a lot of alternative theories sort of to cover this, you know, the universe on a t-shirt, uh, you know, the whole, <laughs> you know, the theory of everything. And we've had this conversation before about the theory of everything. Yeah. You know, do you feel like there are competing theories for the theory of everything or other understandings that are just getting short shrift, they're just not getting the kind I, of resources applied to them? I think that we're kind of at the stage when uh, quantum mechanics was, the people who would end up forming the foundations of quantum mechanics theories were looking at the ultraviolet catastrophe in our understanding of black body radiation and going, huh? this is wrong, we're doing something seriously wrong here, we need new physics. We're at that stage of people going, we need new physics, but not having the major breakthrough that's necessary for the needed innovation. I think quantum mechanics is on the right path. I think that some of the theories related to string theory, but not necessarily at the heart of string theory, are starting in the right direction. Uh, but it's a very young field in terms of being able to make testable claims. Right, right. Yes, I don't know. I mean, I feel like... It has like, a very good PR engine that you have fallen prey to. Well, I haven't necessarily fallen prey to it. I don't go that far. Um, but I, because I just feel like, um, you know, that, that discoveries are made in a bunch of ways, right? In one way yeah. discoveries are made is just when you do observations and something weird happens, you go, huh, that's weird, like dark energy. Yeah and dark matter and, <clears throat> and, and things like that, or quasars, you know, and then later on people work on them, work on them, work on them, come up with, with explanations. But then you have this whole other situation, which is you have these, these big, complex, just mysteries that you don't know why they happen. What was before the Big Bang? Uh, um, you know, how did you get from no life to life? And then what is the fundamental nature of reality? And these questions are super interesting. And boy, if you could get the answer to the, you know, is there life in the universe? I mean, these are, you know, some are more testable than others. Um, I, I interviewed Lawrence Krauss one time, and, and he felt that, that you might, that we would probably reach a point where it is not only practically difficult to to sort of get any more out of physics, but but possibly even like physically impossible, like a you know like a Heisenberg uncertainty theory where you just you know you can't do both. You can't both you learn start more. Start hitting the Planck limit. You yeah, start you can't. The, the yeah, uncertainty you, limit. Yeah, that you can't learn any more about the nature of physics without interfering but we're with the so nature of physics. So far from being oh. at that point. Oh yeah, I mean we're nowhere near the end of science. Which is great. Good thing about having a cold, I can make these really deep voices now. <laughs> the end of science. Yeah, I'm just stupid. <laughs> I wish colds made me sound better instead of making me sound dumber, but I sound dumb. Well, see, I know you you have wanted to not do an episode on string theory, but you know, it sounds like because a lot of interesting things to say about it. Do a facts based show and not a mathematically maybe sort of kind of you have oh, the right PR show. You know that's not a good reason. Come on, it'd be you. It'd be a takedown. It'd be fun. It'd be fun. <laughs> um, and it can get very philosophical, and I think that's yeah, totally no. fine. All right. Okay. You don't get the hate mail I get. Ah, uh, it's the hate mail. No, I, well, we 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 both get plenty of hate mail, which is really weird. Isn't that weird that we get hate mail? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So now next week, I didn't even look, but we now have a calendar. It's related to the sun. That's all I remember. 
Let me just see. <laughs> it's something about something, probably. Um, uh, layers of the Sun. There we go. Yes. So next week we're going to do Layers of the Sun. And uh, now, I will, like I said, I will be traveling, so it could go horribly sideways, but I will really try to get that uh, ready to go and, and from, from remote because it will be fun. So follow our Twitter feeds, and we'll let you know what's happening. And, of course, everything will be posted, as always, on Google+. Uh, we're going to do a, a custom, a strange uh, weekly space hangout on Friday about Comet Ison. So that's going to be happening. I'll be getting more information about that shortly. Um, I will be missing the virtual star party on Sunday, but uh, it may or may not happen. I'm not really sure. And then I'll be in LA, in LA, so we'll figure that out after that. So, right, well, and anything else coming up this week? Some kind learning, of learning space on Wednesday, and everything just keeps chewing along. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching. Thank you, as always, Pamela, for joining me for Astronomy Cast, and we will see you all next time. Sounds good.